broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the second in the 2019 AAAS webinar series called Scientific Collaborations with Human Rights Organizations. Today's topic is Skills to Succeed, Approaches to Blending Science and Human Rights. The discussion will concern work abroad sponsored by Save the Children. These webinars are a project of the Science and Human Rights Co Coalition of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS. The project team includes both social scientists and evaluators of human rights programs. Previous webinars in our three-year series, including critical steps and innovations in program evaluation, are archived at the AAAS website. A link will be available at the end of this webinar. This year, we wanted to showcase the varied ways that scientists, engineers, and health professionals can and do assist human rights organizations. The Skills to Succeed project exemplifies such collaboration, and we're very pleased to feature this work. I am Oliver Moles, organizer of the project team and a social psychologist by training. Our speaker today is Christopher Ying, a specialist in monitoring and evaluation with global experience. He is a senior specialist monitoring evaluation accountability and learning, MEAL, and research at the nonprofit Save the Children. He holds a Bachelor of Arts from Tufts University and Master of Science from American University. Christopher will present on Save the Children's flagship youth employment program, Skills to Succeed, which has collaborated with economists, psychometricians, software engineers, and statisticians on a number of research and digital innovation projects, such as the development of a mobile app to encourage young girls in Indonesia to save money and to support youth in Vietnam to practice their public speaking skills. <clears throat> Christopher will talk for about 40 minutes, a question and answer period will follow, and the webinar will end in an hour at 11 a.m. Eastern time. You may submit questions at any time via the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. Now let me turn the program over to Christopher Ying. Thank you very much, Ali, and good morning, everybody. I thought I'd start out by giving everybody kind of a background on Save the Children and the work that it does. Save the Children is the leading independent organization for children, reaching 125 million children in over 120 countries worldwide. We are committed to giving every child a healthy start, a good education, and protection from harm, and to serving the most marginalized communities. We are driven by the knowledge that economically secure households provide a more stable foundation for children to stay healthy, be protected, and thrive. And within Save the Children's vast portfolio, I work on the Skills to Succeed program. And this program's mission is to equip deprived and at-risk adolescents and youth with the skills and job linkages they need to find decent jobs and build their own businesses. The program offers um, training in employability skills, entrepreneurship skills, and vocational skills, as well as provides on-the-job training, career counseling, and job linkage services to young men and women aged 15 to 24 living in urban and peri-urban communities. So just to give everybody a, a sense of the kind of the history and geography of the Skills to Succeed program, or S2S as we call it, um, since 2010, we've received um, grants from our primary donor, Accenture, to operate in a number of different countries. This diagram shows you kind of the evolution from 2010. Um, and currently we're under um, Global Grant 5, which covers five countries, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Mexico, and we're starting a pilot program in Italy with refugee migrant youth in um, urban areas. And the current grant is going to take us to 2020. Since the program's inception in 2010, uh, we have served more than 100,000 young migrants, refugees, young mothers, some slum dwellers, youth working in hazardous conditions, and youth at risk of prostitution and trafficking. And our goal is by 2020, we aim to reach more than 200,000 youth. So just to go into a little bit to how the, the S2S theory of change works, and this, is, this diagram here is a very scaled down and simplified version of our theory of change. We run 
training in a number of skills, as I mentioned before, employability skills, entrepreneurship skills, vocational skills. And we also provide on the job training. We also try to link youth to opportunities and networks um, in the labor market through job linkage events. Um, one prominent example that exists um, across our countries is job fairs. We host job fairs to bring youth and employers together so that youth learn more about potential careers and employers know about um, what youth are looking for in terms of jobs. From those activities, we expect that youth gain the skills that we train them in, that they become familiar with potential employers and jobs, and that employers learn about skills to succeed youth and their abilities and potential. And the, the goal of all this is that at-risk and deprived youth secure decent employment and self-employment opportunities to benefit themselves and their families. Just to give you kind of a, a more, even a more simplified version of our program pathways and kind of interventions, um, we recruit both in school and out of school youth. And uh, our populations differ slightly depending on the countries that we're in. As I mentioned, um, in Italy, we're looking at refugee migrant youth that are out of school. Um, in Indonesia, we work with uh, in-school youth in the vocational school system there. Um, in Bangladesh, we work with um, out-of-school youth in uh, slum areas of Dhaka. So the population differs depending on what country we're in. Um, but throughout those countries, we train youth in employability skills, vocational skills, and entrepreneurship skills. And just as an aside, anybody who's not familiar with the terminology of employability skills, Employability skills are those skills, uh, sometimes referred to as uh, soft skills or non-cognitive skills. They include things such as uh, communication skills, social skills, um, as well as things like self-control and positive self-concept. Um, entrepreneurship skills obviously uh, look at uh, building uh, businesses to be, for, for you to be self-employed. And then vocational skills are skills that are related to a specific sector. As I mentioned, we prepare youth uh, using job linkage support and mentorship. And then the goal, the ultimate goal is to place youth in paid jobs, paid apprenticeships, or self-employment. As part of the Skills Exceed program, we have a very robust research and learning agenda with the objective of conducting research and learning activities to learn what works and what does not work in order to achieve the objectives of the S2S program. Um, the program has been running a long time, um, and we definitely learned uh, things that have worked and things that have not, but there's a lot still that needs to be learned in order to replicate this program in other contexts or to scale this program to reach even more beneficiaries than it has in the past. So in order to do that, we've identified key research questions to which we align all research and learning activities in the program to. And you can see the list down below here on the slide. Um, we look at how effective the current program has been in meeting its objectives um, in terms of providing youth with skills and job linkages they need to find decent jobs or build their own businesses. We also look at what program components or combination of program components are most effective in achieving our objectives. We spend a lot of time thinking about gender. We know gender is a, a critically important factor in terms of where youth end up in terms of their employment and careers. Um, so we want to better understand how gender influences our program and how the program can address issues related to gender. And finally, uh, we really want to know how uh, the SOS program can be sustained through local actors. Uh, we partner with a variety of local actors in different contexts, uh, local government bodies, partner NGOs. Uh, we really want to know how these activities can exist beyond the lifetime of the program and its funding. And so this is one area where collaborations come in, particularly with social scientists. Um, Save the Children often engages with consultants and partner organizations on research. And this is a result of our need for outside expertise particularly around research methodologies and methods and statistical analysis. Um, and the way that these collaborations happens, it's different depending on the nature of the study or learning activity that we're talking about. Um, sometimes uh, what will happen is that uh, we come across in, in talking with different organizations, the opportunity for collaboration pops up and we, we engage with organizations to, to um, 
to partner on research learning activities. Sometimes we go, we, you know, in designing a research or learning activity, we identify the need for outside expertise. Um, and thus we, we reach out to consultants and partners um, to look for that expertise. Um, overall, these partnerships have been extremely valuable and I'll go into a couple of exam examples in a moment. Um, but these partnerships can also be challenging as many experts and consultants are not, not familiar with the context in which we work. Um, and so that creates uh, some challenges when we get to the end in terms of, of what we're able to say on the research and learning um, when we try and, try and link outside experts work with our own expertise. So to go into a little bit more detail, let me dump, jump into some specific examples. Um, one big research activity that we do, and we've been doing it annually now for the past couple of years, is a performance evaluation on how well the program is, is working. Um, and I want to highlight one, one performance evaluation that happened a couple of years ago um, in 2015 and 2016 that looked to document the performance of the program from 2012 to 2016 in four countries, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and China. And the goal of this evaluation was to evaluate the program's state of theory of change and identify areas of the program in need of modifications. Um, and this was specifically focused on our employability skills training. Specifically, what we wanted to know was, uh, since the employability skills training is really the core of our program, kind of the main intervention that everybody gets, one, we wanted to know that our training was actually increasing the employability skills of the youth we serve. Um, we also want to know, do increased employability skills, are they associated with the employment outcomes we sought to, to achieve with our program? So this evaluation was designed in-house um, by my predecessor, um, and it was quickly realized that we needed to um, find some, some outside expertise to help us with statistical analysis. And this is where we engage with Statistics Without Borders um, to help us do the statistical analysis to answer the questions that we were looking to answer, as well as to help us with data visualization so that we could communicate our findings back to key stakeholders, both here in the US and in the countries that we work. Um, this collaboration was extremely fruitful. Um, so we, through the result of this collaboration, we did find that our employability skills training is associated with increased employability skills. So our theory of change did hold when we, when we uh, evaluated it. But we identified the fact that none of our countries at that time were evaluating acquisition of employability skills the same way. They were all using different methodologies and different tools. And so it made it very difficult to do any kind of cross-country um, analysis. So the, one of the main recommendations that, that came out of this performance evaluation was that we need to develop a standardized tool to measure employability skills acquisition. Um, that recommendation eventually led to the development of the employability assessment tool, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but again, an extremely fruitful collaboration that we had. Another research exa another example of research where we collaborated with, with external partners um, was a randomized control trial we conducted in Vietnam. And the goal of this randomized control trial was to evaluate the impact of adding a financial capability component to the standard S2S program model in Vietnam. Um, so the reason behind looking at financial capability specifically was um, through literature and through kind of talking with our teams, we recognize the fact that um, savings behaviors and access to um, financial institutions um, could be critical in terms of helping us achieve our objectives. And we had a couple of hypotheses around why this was so. One was that we recognized that there were certain costs related to a job search. These costs could be uh, paying for transportation to get to a job interview or printing out copies of your of your CV or resume, or paying to get key pieces of identification that were needed in order to process um, workplace paperwork. So if you did not have the finances necessary to, to meet these costs, then that would ultimately hinder our objective of getting youth into work. 
Um, so savings and access to savings institutions would be, may be able to help mitigate this financial constraint that youth might face. Another hypothesis was that by encouraging savings behavior, which is related to, to some elements of employability skills, that this would reinforce the employability skills that we were providing training in and would boost um, the value and appeal of our youth to employers and make them more employable. So we wanted to test this, and we wanted to test this using kind of rigorous methods. So we decided to do a randomized control trial. Um, but we didn't have a lot of expertise in terms of running randomized control trials in-house. So what we did was we reached out to Oxford University, um, to um, the economics department, and brought on board um, a faculty member from Oxford University and a, a PhD candidate from Oxford University to help us develop a pre-analysis plan, develop data collection tools, and run data analysis for, for the randomized control trial. Um, the result of this was a little bit mixed. Um, we, we, our results in Vietnam didn't really find any correlation or connection between providing financial capability training and increased employability skills or impl uh, um, the employment outcomes we sought to seek in the program. Um, and in fact, we really didn't see any kind of evidence of the, our hypothesis in terms of the financial constraints that I was talking about before, or the idea that savings reinforced employability skills. We did see um, from our results that there was some boost in employment for youth who had never saved prior to the program. So this um, might indicate that, uh, you know, in terms of targeting specific interventions, we might see boosted impact for particular populations if we tailored our interventions towards those populations. But for the most part, the, our results were fairly mixed. Um, and it was, it was extremely helpful to partner with the Oxford University Fellows. It really made us rethink how we approach um, deciding methodologies. Um, obviously, for those of you familiar with randomized control trials, these, these are, this is the gold standard for evaluation. Um, but what we learned is that, you know, we really, uh, uh, for randomized control trials, you really need to be ready to run a randomized control trial. And in Vietnam, uh, our team was not familiar with randomized control trials, and thus it made, made implementing this, this um, study challenging. So one of the things that we've, we've done since this is really make sure that we've done the formative groundwork, a lot of um, qualitative work, a lot of um, less rigorous um, initial formative work to make sure that we're ready to test um, via randomized control trials, um, which has been extremely helpful in terms of shaping our current research and learning agenda. And a final example on research and learning is, as I mentioned before, our employability assessment tool. So as I mentioned, um, our, our performance evaluation back in 2015, 2016 showed that we needed a standardized tool to measure employability skills. Um, so we wanted to develop, we didn't just want to develop a standardized tool, we wanted to develop a psychometrically valid and reliable tool to measure the acquisition of employability skills. Um, anybody who's familiar with assessment tools of this nature, psychometrics, knows that there are hundreds of tools for, for an, any number of skill set, and employability schools are, are no exception to this. Um, so we really want to make sure that we did our homework right and really developed a tool that could be used properly. Um, and so what we did was we reached out to a number of outside experts, and we also partnered with Habi Education Lab, which is a research partner in the Philippines, to help us develop this data collection tool. Um, and we spent a lot of time looking at all the tools that exist for measuring this skill set, deciding kind of what we need to prioritize. Um, and the result of this was the development of a 24-item tool that is designed to be easy to administer and implement, um, not only by our staff um, here in the US and in our field offices, but also through our partner organization staff, wherever they are. And to date, um, the tool has been used in a number of different contexts, as widely as in Mexico with in-school youth in Monterey, um, to using it in China with, um, factory workers in Guangzhou and Shenzhen. 
and we've translated and adapted to what I believe now into seven languages. So this was a highly fruitful collaboration. Um, the tool is as held in terms of its, its psychometric uh, validity and reliability, and so we've been extremely happy with um, uh, the results of this collaboration with Habe Education Lab and, and outside experts. So to shift gears a little bit away from research and learning and talk about S2S and our use of uh, information communication technology, or ICT, um, we at S2S are exceedingly um, uh, keen to advocate for the use of ICT uh, and incorporating it into our program. We recognize that, you know, in the 21st century, digital access is becoming increasingly important to building skills and networks and gaining employment opportunities. And so to that end, across our program countries, um, we, we employ a range of ICT-powered solutions um, for example, we use uh, web-based e-learning and mobile technologies, and we also try to promote um, digital skills uh, for our youth to be better prepared for 21st century employment. And to that end, similar to, to what we do with research and learning, we engage with a variety of partners to provide much-needed expertise in software design and development. Um, you know, we don't have software engineers in-house. Uh, Save is not, not a tech company. Um, so we really need to, you know, if we want to design an e-learning platform for a program in Bangladesh, we really need help. And so we've reached out to a number of organizations to help us with this. Um, and we've definitely seen challenges with these engagements. You know, there's definitely, definitely benefit to, to collaborating outside for this type of work, um, but there's definitely challenges. Um, that includes a lack of understanding of the context, similar to, to what I talked about with research and learning. But also a, a very significant challenge in the difficulties of translating the development language, the international development language and jargon, with IT language, which, as anybody knows, is, is very different. Um, and so there's a, there's a heavy need for kind of the translation of those two languages when you're working together. So let me dive into some, some, some specific examples in terms of kind of the ICT work that we've done on Skills Succeed. The first is the Do It mobile app. Um, and this is a mobile application that we've developed in Indonesia. Uh, for anybody familiar with Bahasa Indonesian, uh, Do It is the word for money. Um, and, the, and the function of this mobile application is to promote financial literacy and savings for adolescent girls specifically, but it can be used with other deprived youth. And the way this application works is that um, we, uh, you download the application and are encouraged to set savings goals for themselves. Maybe they want to save for something they want to buy. Maybe they want to save for going on a trip. Maybe they want to save for education. Maybe they want to save for emergencies. And so they set that goal in the application and then set a budget towards that goal. And the app helps them create that budget as well as provides small behavioral nudges through the application to keep them on track, to help them save, um, and to stick to their budget. And so uh, this application was designed and developed in partnership with PreCal Foundation and Retro Rabbit, um, two organizations that help us kind of put this application together. And they were involved from the beginning in terms of doing the initial market research, in terms of, in terms of what how this application could look um, in terms of, uh, you know, how the application worked, how we designed the application, the marketing behind it. Um, unfortunately, we found that in the initial, the initial rollout of the application, we had uh, basically some mixed results. Um, we had over 3,000 youth download the application, um, but that was well short of our, our target for, for downloads. Um, and one of the reasons why we ran into some trouble is uh, just uh, through um, a couple of errors that happened during the development. One such error, error was that um, through RetroRapid and PreCal Foundation, we tried to design the app to be, um, to, to be able to work on the, on the lowest end of the Android operating system as possible. But what we end up finding, finding out is a lot of youth um, in, the, in, in, our, in, the, in Indonesia, in the places that we work, 
use very low-end versions of Android and very kind of low-end phones to the point where the application didn't work. Um, they, they, could, they, could, they could download the application, but the application wouldn't function very well. Um, we also found that there were a lot of bugs in the initial application. We didn't um, test the application well enough before it was rolled out. And so that caused a lot of youth to be turned off once they downloaded the app, saw the bugs, and they stopped using it. Um, we also found that we want the app to be sustainable for the, uh, the Indonesian market and for our Indonesian team to be able to use it and build on it. Um, but the app was originally coded um, in a language, a coding language that was not commonly used in Indonesia. And this is partially as a result of uh, Prekel and RetroRabbit being based in South Africa as opposed to Indonesia. And so this created a lot of challenges in terms of, in terms of creating sustainability for the application because again, it, we couldn't easily turn it over to Indonesian developers to either host or build, build on the app. So mixed results in terms of this, in terms of this application development. So what we ended up doing is that um, we ended up turning over the application from, from Prekel and RetroRabbit to a local Indonesian developer who ended up recoding the entire application um, and uh, uh, you know, basically creating a, a, a version 2.0 of the application. This application, is, this revised application has just become live again and we're currently using it um, in the program um, and looking to build its functionality in the future in terms of perhaps linking it to um, formal finance institutions and building out uh, its, its content and functionality further. Another uh, ICT collaboration that we've done is the Beck XR Extended Reality Mobile App. Um, and this is an application that was designed to introduce youth in Vietnam to potential workplaces and to help practice their interview skills. And you can see a picture of it on the right here. And for anybody who's not familiar with augmented reality, um, let me kind of try and articulate how the application works. When you boot up the application, you bring the application to your face. And if you have a headset, you put your phone in a headset to create kind of a, a 3D environment. Um, you point your phone using the phone's camera to a text which allows the application to prompt, um, which creates an avatar in the camera image, which you can see here. So this is basically a picture of my colleague's desk here with a piece of paper. And the paper prompts the application to create this avatar to start interacting with. Once the avatar is activated through your eye motions on the application, you can access different content. So for example, one uh, content you see on the application is a 3D image of a workplace, say a hotel, where you can click on different parts of the hotel that will tell you more about uh, a, a potential job that you would get in, in that hotel. Um, another piece of content is that you can click on something that will allow you to sit in front of a virtual avatar and practice giving an interview uh, to that avatar to help them practice their interview skills. So it's, it's a, essentially kind of a virtual reality, kind of augmented reality experience. We developed this with um, Accenture Development Partnerships, which is the um, consulting arm of our primary donor, Accenture. And how this resulted was that um, Accenture was really interested in uh, looking to develop some use of augmented reality um, in the places that we work. So it reached out to us and said, you know, would you be interested in, in um, in developing something like this. And so we worked with our team to see how we can incorporate this technology into our programming. And, and the result was, was this Beck XR um, mobile app. We are currently in the process of piloting this application. Um, in terms, um, piloting this application uh, to about 500 youth through August of this year. And we're already in discussion with Accenture in terms of um, uh, seeking to look for different places to roll this out in different, to take this to other contexts, other countries and develop a similar version of the application. So I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you for letting me present and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. 
Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, Christopher, thank you so much for this uh, very interesting and uh, very detailed and informative uh, uh, discussion. We do have some questions, and uh, so let me uh, put the first one to you, and uh, please, other folks, uh, feel free to add uh, questions, too. Uh, the first one uh, asks, how did you develop the relationship with Oxford University Fellows? Was it a PhD or MSc, a Master of Science program arena? Was something like that considered in developing that relationship? So that's a great question. Um, in this case, this collaboration was done through personal connections. Um, this is actually the connection, the, uh, the partnership was initially kicked off by my predecessor who was looking for, again, some, some help with developing kind of randomized control trial methodology um, and, and helping with the analysis. She knew um, she wanted to have uh, kind of the, the economic lens on this. Um, and so through her connections, she um, talked to a number of people who connected her to the Oxford University Department of Economics. Um, and specifically to the PhD program, because we wanted people who were experts in this type of methodology. So that's how that collaboration arose. And again, it was a, it was a very helpful and fruitful collaboration for us. Uh, we might uh, expand that uh, conversation to ask you about uh, how you find uh, collaborators in general uh, and uh, with the other kinds of uh, projects you were mentioning here and what in general you might be looking for in collaborators and, and how well this has worked. Yes. So overall, I mean, as an organization and particularly as a program, you know, there's a lot of need for, for outside expertise. We're very versed in, in international development in terms of designing programs, implementing programs, managing programs, but there are a lot of areas where, you know, we need somebody to help us, experts, to know to, that know what they're doing, to help inform our work. Um, so we really value we really value the 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 added benefit of collaborations across the board. Um, and these collaborations, you know, sometimes they come from our needs. Um, you know, we're looking looking for somebody to help us analyze data or somebody to help us design something. Um, but sometimes they come naturally in terms of interacting with different organizations um, who suggest things, suggest partnerships, and we, we look to see where we can expand our work um, and build on what we've done to, to achieve even a higher impact than we have with the program. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, here is just a... Uh follow-up uh, about the Oxford and Oxford Fellows, are they interested in continuing and developing the collaboration that uh, you set up with them? So initially we, um, I still have connections to the to the, the fellows that we worked with. We haven't done any kind of continuous collaboration with them. This was a little bit of a kind of a one-time collaboration. However, we continue with our research and learning agenda to reach out to um, a number of uh, different organizations. Um, for example, we're currently in the process of developing a randomized control trial in Bangladesh um, to look at the program model as well as to analyze um, the effects of gender on our program. And in this case, we're, we're partnering with um, a personal connection that I have through University of Connecticut um, with a faculty member there in the economics department, um, again, to help us with designing the study and, and running the analysis. So uh, we do, we, we try and continue those collaborations, but we also are constantly looking for new partners as well to, to help us with different aspects of the program and to bring in outside expertise. Very good, thank you. We have a different kind of question here. Um, is Save the Children also building up its in-house research and learning capabilities, or, you, or do you prefer collaborations with academics and consultants for research skills? That's a great question. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of both. We are in the process, we're always in the process of building our capacity internally for research um, and learning. Um, there's a very concerted effort right now to build up our expertise across our movement globally 
so that you know there's no there's there's research and, and learning expertise throughout you know globally th throughout the organization but there's always a value in bringing in um external expertise especially especially in the in the academic world um to provide not only not, not only to provide their expertise but provide another uh perspective or lens on the work that we're doing um it's easy to get uh narrow-sided or siloed in the work that you do and, I, and we always find that kind of having that external lens to help us look at things a different way is, is exceedingly useful um to achieving our objectives aha uh -huh. very good please uh continue to give us uh, your questions and we'll uh, we'll carry on um question here about uh, the collaboration that you have as to what has uh, worked well and what challenges um, you may have faced in the collaborations uh, that you described and, and others perhaps uh, to um, uh, indicate as specifically as, as you can perhaps uh, uh, the challenges that you may have experienced in working with these outside organizations and individuals uh, as well as what worked well. So definitely one of the main challenges is kind of where to bring in outside expertise in terms of, in terms of the nature of the activity or the project that you're looking at. Um, initially, you know, what we would do is uh, we would design something out of our needs. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times, you know, we look for the outside expertise, as I mentioned. Um, and oftentimes that doesn't work very well. Um, as I mentioned before, one of our main challenges is, is making sure that whoever we're working with understands the context in which we work. And that's very difficult for somebody to do when you, you know, drop a scope in their lap and ask them, you know, go out and collect this data and run the analysis. Um, so what we try to do now, you know, currently and moving forward is making sure that we bring in outside expertise as early as possible in the design phase of whatever we're looking at um, so that they can weigh in, they can, they can provide that external lens I talked about before. Um, and be more versed in what we're doing so that they, by the time they get to their scope, um, are, you know, are fully versed and can ask the right questions and, and, and provide that, that kind of information in the analysis that they do. Um, and sometimes this isn't always possible. It isn't always to bring in, you know, external people in the beginning, um, but we try and do that as much as possible. Um, I think again, in terms of what, what, is gone well is again it, it gives us that external lens again you know the recommendations that people provide to us um are exceedingly valuable um as i mentioned one of the you know one of the main recommendations out of our work with statistics without borders was the development of a tool that is has been served that now served us several years and has been excellent for helping us um, evaluate our program um and to give us ideas to to give us you know uh, you know where we could go, you know what we could do further on in terms of in terms of different research and learning or ICT um, that we might not have thought of had we not engaged with somebody externally. We have uh, a follow-on uh, still on the theme of the collaborations and the question here about uh, whether it's uh, whether your plans uh, are to develop relationships with other universities. Uh, and how fruitful uh, are these uh, directions for your work? Uh, could you say a bit more about this? Sure. And I'll speak a little bit not only to my work, but more externally to, to uh, some other work I know that Save the Children uh, is doing as well outside of my, my initial scope. Um, yes, we, all, we, like to, we definitely like to build kind of existing relationships with the universities. The challenge is for us um, particularly in skills to succeed, is that because we run on a project cycle, there's not always work to do with universities. I mean, we have, as I mentioned, we have a very robust learning and research agenda, but that doesn't always require an external partner. Um, that being said, again, we always like to, to reach out to people that we know we've worked well with, who, who like working with us um, to build those collaborations. Um, Outside of my initial work, though, I know, for example, that um, in the Department of Education and Child Protection here at Save the Children, uh, we have a program called um, SUPER, which brings in university fellows um, 
to bring them in and do specific research pieces for us um, related to, to um, education and child protection. So uh, the, Save the Children is always looking for, for partnerships um, in the academic community. Um, and we do have a couple of mechanisms that, that are more regular than the work that I do in Skills Succeed that to try and maintain those relationships over time. Uh, another, I just thought of another, um, some work that we're doing now with Tufts University actually, um, through their um, Center for Resilience. We have a couple of students, um, a couple of master's students from the Fletcher School actually, working on research studies focused on res economic resilience. Um, and they're, they're coming in the next couple of weeks to present their findings as well as write a paper based on the, the field work that they've done over the last year. So Save the Children's Organization is always looking to, to partner um, with academic institutions to help us with, with research and learning. Uh, and I think from the standpoint of uh, uh, the coalition and the work that we're doing with this, uh, it's a very important kind of work too. We're particularly interested in these webinars in uh, presenting information that may be useful for small and middle-sized uh, organizations, uh, human rights organizations, uh, Save the Children being a, a large one, of course, but uh, still things that may be useful and uh, uh, given small budgets, uh, the kinds of collaboration with uh, universities and with individuals and with groups like uh, Statistics Without Borders uh, uh, and uh, Sociologists Without Borders and other groups like that uh, is uh, very useful and, and uh, very important uh, for stretching small budgets, but also getting uh, uh, very uh, capable uh, uh, researchers and uh, uh, people to collaborate uh, to uh, uh, provide information about whether it's program evaluation or uh, uh, the conditions that uh, human rights organizations may be facing. Um, we have a question here. Um, how does Save the Children go about achieving informed consent with minors and guardians, specifically in regards to the Do It application app and uh, Becca XR? with data collection and analysis? That's a fantastic question. So in terms of informed consent in a sense, um, just to, to talk about Save the Children a little bit, Save the Children is very much in, very much invested and, and, and finds it critical to, to tackle what we call child safeguarding, of which informed consent in a sense is part of, part of child safeguarding, making sure the children are safe and they're, they're um, not exposed to possible risks or dangers um, through our work. So for things like, uh, you know, the Do It Mobile application and Beck XR, we've thought a lot about informed consent and assent, about what data we collect from children in terms of personal identifiable data um, and how to protect them given, you know, the nature of all the different, you know, legal frameworks and ethical frameworks that exist around this type of work. Um, and we spent, um, particularly uh, with, with Do It and Beck XR, we're still looking at the best ways to approach this. I can say for, um, for informed consent and assent, we always ask assent. Um, we found it challenging with informed consent, particularly with minors to get parents involved. Um, sometimes because in our programs, we don't have access to parents maybe because of a result of the population that we work with where youth may be away from their parents if they're migrants or um, we, you know, parents aren't literate. And so we have challenges, you know, making sure that the, the, the consent we get from parents is informed consent. So in do it, what we've done so far is kind of make a note for you to say, you know, ask your parents permission before using the application. This isn't satisfactory to us. We're still looking at kind of options to kind of get at, at consent. Um, for Becca XR, what we've done is that we've um, done the same thing, but we've also made sure to really cramp down the, the amount of identifiable information that we can collect, where we really don't collect much of anything beyond age and gender. Um, so it's a really great question. It's a question that we're still exploring, still trying to answer um, satisfactorily. Um, and this is definitely something, I know a, a colleague of mine on the program, we have a a specialist for uh, ICT for development on our on our staff, 
and one of his current projects is around digital safeguarding, dealing with these issues. So this is definitely something we continue to to explore and grapple with as we work with ICT in the program. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, want to turn to another methodology a question. You are using uh, uh, random uh, control trials uh, in a variety of places, and I can see, uh, could you say a bit about the advantages of that, of course, but also what limits there might be uh, to using RCTs, uh, how useful they have been, and are there other methods that uh, uh, are useful to supplement uh, RCTs, uh, which may sometimes be difficult to execute. Yes. So we've had mixed results with randomized control trials. Um, and just just to just to start out, you know, for anybody who's you know a firm advocate of RCTs, you know, we do recognize the gold standard. We do recognize the value of it, but we also recognize that there are limitations to to randomized control trials. They oftentimes can can answer the what, but without um, you know, if you're not doing mixed methods, if you're not doing substantial qualitative work, um, they can't answer the why questions. And a lot of the questions that we have as, as an implementer is around why questions, why things are happening the way they are. Um, and that goes back to something I mentioned previously is, is really making sure, something that we've learned is really making sure that we've done our formative, ho formative homework before we jump into a randomized control trial to make sure that we've done you know, before we test anything with that methodology to make sure that we um, have done the, the initial to work to make sure that, you know, we're testing the right thing, we're asking the right questions. And that involves a lot of uh, qualitative work, you know, a lot of focus group and interview work, um, as well as, as, as quantitative, um, quantitative follow-up with our youth. Um, specifically with randomized control trials, a very, very, key challenge is is the development of a control group um, as an implementing organization um, for children we don't want to leave anybody out um, and so it's hard to to create a pure control group um, that doesn't get a program intervention and we tried to mitigate this in different ways you know using a kind of a staggered rollout approach but that can be challenging given funding given kind of a donor commitments um, you know, we've looked at, uh, in the example of the, the Money Matters study I presented before in Vietnam, the control group is a control group for answering a, you know, one group is getting the S2S program, one group is getting the S2S program plus financial capability. So it's a control group, but it's not a pure control group in that nobody's getting anything. So we tried tricks like that, um, but it is, it's, it is definitely challenging. So we have we have looked at other methods, quasi-experimental methods, to try and answer the same questions. Um, and then when we feel that we're ready, when we feel we have the staff in place, the expertise in place, that we have the the environment in place, we continue to try and do randomized control trials to answer specific questions. Very good. Thank you, thank you, Christopher, for all this information. We want to give you a hearty thanks to you and to all the project team, including Joel Erickson of AAAS for his technical support. I think it goes without saying, but it is worth repeating here that for assistance in designing and conducting project and program evaluations, we recommend very much gaining the aid of an evaluation expert at the beginning of the project uh, so as to help uh, and to uh, uh, build along with it. As plans unfold for further 2019 webinars in this year's series, you will be notified, and one is planned for late June and others in the fall. At the end of this webinar, an online poll will appear on your screen, and we urge you to take a minute to respond to it. We need your feedback to improve future webinars. Comments may also be directed to me, Oliver Moles, project team leader at ocmoles at gmail.com. Again, past webinars in this series can be viewed at www.aaas.org slash coalition slash projects slash science collabs. That's science, C-O-L-A-B-S, altogether. Thank you for joining us.